David Sims, welcome to Show Studio. Thank you. First question, it's a big question. What makes a great fashion image? That is a very big question. Uh, I can only probably describe it in its in terms of its ingredients. I think it's got to first of all have attitude and it's got to speak about style, probably character. I think it's going to talk about whatever the person's wearing, but I think for me that has to come after all those other things. Mm. It's interesting to me that you, you say character, because I think that's one of the things that I love about your, your imagery, is you get a sense of there being a, a lot of enjoyment and a lot of um, communication, and sometimes a sense of kind of like revelry on the shoot, and you look at it and you imagine that those people were being quite spontaneous and having a lot of fun. But then, is that the case? Are your shoots fun, or is it sometimes... Are you anxious to get the picture? I wouldn't describe myself, but I mean, I think I have my moments of being kind of, uh, you know, free and having fun, but are quite serious, really. But I mean the people in front of your camera. It, it ha has to depend on whoever that person is. I mean, it, it, if it's somebody who's not so comfortable, I have there's certain kind of things, that I, devices, that I can kind of take them through that makes it seem as though they're sort of... Uh, being spontaneous. Like what? I kind of wouldn't. It's not because I want to keep secrets. I think I just feel silly sort of describing. <laughs> they are a bit naff. <laughs> I'm sure they're not. Um, we've talked a little bit about kind of your views on imagery, but I want to go back and actually kind of talk through your life because when you were young, you grew up in Yorkshire. Were you kind of creative when you were a kid? Well, I, did, I mean, my parents, I was born in Sheffield. My parents come from Liverpool originally and just every couple of years or so we, we moved further south it wasn't that I kind of spent any particular time in any one area mm -hmm. I, I've, I I'm probably most informed by the years between sort of 11 and 16 which was spent just sort of outside in the home counties sort of agricultural farming areas not very much going on at all and I suppose by comparison to a lot of the people there I kind of looked outside of those areas for it's funny those areas can kind of can tend to be a little bit insular so if you if you if you if you are if you want to be different you it shows up quite quickly and that in itself kind of i suppose pushes you on does that mm. make sense did you want to be different then yes still do i think <laughs> well that i wouldn't sort of i don't think i appear to be like that but i've, I've always sort of thought to myself or I've, I've grown to accept that you know that outsider part of me is probably the the thing that drives my ambition most mm. uh, you know i think you you know in the late years i've kind of probably become uh more affected by the business side of what i do mm. i perhaps participate in it more but prior to that the money wasn't the 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 important thing I think it was it was a need for some kind of uh, validation that's interesting I wanted to ask you that later but it's pertinent now because I think it's simplistic but I think a lot of people would describe your work as anti-fashion and I wondered as you yourself became a part of the fashion establishment and as, and as you say working a lot more with the real kind of like the big brands in fashion if that affected your aesthetic but also if that affected you and your outlook as a person yeah, it does. I think, you know what, I'd love to sit here and say I wasn't affected by it. But, but however, there still remains that, you know, younger self. Not, not only rebellious. I mean, I, don't, I never really thought of myself as anti-fashion because I didn't really have a, gri a grip on what fashion was. I mean, mm. when, when me and the group of people kind of that I collaborated with started, I don't think we were even very particularly aware of fashion seasons. I mean, of course, I knew the real seasons. <laughs> but I mean, to say I didn't particularly understand the business at all and I for me the distinction is kind of what I talk about style and not fashion fashion is the industrial mm. kind of realm whereas style I think is everything that that you know if, if people aren't brought up in that environment if they're not sort of um, there because it, it's been part, part of their upbringing I think it's because they have an interest in in, in style and, and that in a, in a sort of broader sense, is just how people express themselves. And I think, I don't want to sort of start flag-waving, but I think in Britain at a certain point in time, 
that's that's all we had. It's what we had as 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 teenagers. Mm. I can't speak for teens now I think maybe it, 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 it matters less to distinguish yourself in the way you dress mm. the, the tribes don't seem to kind of matter anymore mm. but when I was growing up that's that's that was that was really something that um, it was very potent and and I think that just kind of transferred into kind of uh, you know the kind of image making that I did mm. tell me what you said then about sort of working with the the more commercial clients, and you said, I didn't do it for the money, I did it for a need for validation. Validation from who? Well, I suppose that was a reaction to not having had any kind of sort of success at school. So, you know, I, 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 I didn't assume that I was going to succeed as a photographer. I, I, what I wanted to do was make sure my pictures appealed to a certain group. And that if I was getting the kind of response that I'd hoped for from within that group, I'd feel good about myself. What group was that? Uh, outsiders, I guess. Really? What, but what is an outsider? I couldn't necessarily off the bat just, 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 just define what the, uh, mm. that, that group of people is. There's something about wanting to, to fit and not feeling that you fit is, is a slightly confused uh, experience. <laughs> Would you say you're quite confused as a person? Yeah, I mean, I tend to overthink things, and I think there's a reason for that. I'm not, I don't, things, you know, uh, I take on quite slowly to uh, ideas because I want to understand them thoroughly. Once I do that, once I'm sort of in possession of what I consider to be a, a deep understanding, I'm more confident with it. Uh, so there has to be a frame around that which appears to be quite confused, yeah. Let's go back and talk more about when you were a boy, because... You mentioned kind of school because you left school when you were 17. Were you ambitious in, in any ways? Did you think about things like career or were you, what were you like as a young person? Uh, oh. I mean, probably just a little shit really, honestly. I was ambitious but had no uh, uh, reason to feel like uh, I would succeed. I, you know, I have a tendency in this kind of discussion to go on about school because for me it was a, a profoundly unsuccessful period of my life <laughs> and, and it was mutual. I mean, school hated me and I hated school, so it just didn't, it was never going to work out. I was one of those children that should have probably been sort of, you know, sent somewhere uh, <laughs> probably that didn't involve me disrupting other people's education. Did you have a gang? I have a what? A gang? You have a gang, like a group of <laughs> so friends. So I thought you said a gun. <laughs> a gun. <laughs> Good job, I didn't have a gun. <laughs> that uh, would be the real scoop of this interview. <laughs> Day Sims, gun crime. <laughs> I had a gang, yeah. Me and uh, my gang consisted of me and one other person. Who was that? A very, very dear friend called Andrew, who... Uh, he was a little bit older. He started out being my brother's friend. And my brother was the brains in the family, so he, got, he actually made his way to a, a, a far better school than my sister. I have a twin sister, I should probably mention that, but he made uh, his way to a school that was some distance from home, and it sort of separated him from us a little bit. Uh, he went to a more academic school, I guess, and uh, slowly but surely, or in fact, not, not true at all, actually, and, in the spate of one evening, I, I suddenly became friends with somebody who'd been a very close friend of his, this guy Andrew, because my brother was doing homework or something and didn't want to go out. So I went down the local chip shop and him being a little bit older than me, I found out quite a lot about the birds and bees that night. <laughs> you mentioned your school hated you, you hated school, but do you not think that that time and even, I guess that like feral teenagehood where you're kind of wasting time and you don't know what you're doing and you're wandering around, has that influenced you and what you find beautiful and what you find intriguing? Oh yeah, no, it, I can't escape. I mean, even if I want to leave that sort of influence behind, it still keeps coming back. There's a fondness for it, which sometimes is, it sort of embarrasses me a little bit because it's so, it's so persistent and I would like to think that I can move on and find kind of, you know, new inspiration and, 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 and different horizons, but it's not to be. Mm. Are you intrigued by teenagers today? That You mentioned earlier that perhaps they're, they're less in 
less passionate about sort of being individuals? Do you look at young people? And I, find mean, I wouldn't say that categorically because I just don't claim to know. I think that you know the the flow of information now is so is so is so fast and it's so broad that I think people don't have to adopt uh, identities quite in, in perhaps in the same way that they did in our generation. But sometimes those kind of statements can sound really silly because mm. there are probably lots of teenagers out there who disagree wholeheartedly and I'm not trying to speak for them. Mm. Um, I've lost the train of your original question actually. I just, do you look at young people and find them fascinating? Yes. On what level? Uh, I couldn't exactly say. I suppose what I'm looking for, I think most of all, I'm not particularly interested in the style or fashions that seem to kind of happen now because I feel like I'm so familiar with them all. But music would be probably the thing that I would, you know, want to know more about and, and still get stimulus for. Because mm. tell me, because you were very into music as a kid, you kind of talked about that as interviews before, like things like punk and new wave. When did that interest come about? I was always interested in music. I can I can remember sort of standing up for one or particular bands that I liked, even as even as something like going. F I can kind of remember my childhood distinctly because we move so regularly I can think what was I doing in that house at that particular time so when I say I remember age six listening to bands and my brother and sister sort of saying it was ridiculous to listen to that kind of music you know and I felt strongly about it strongly enough to stand up for it so I suppose that would suggest that you know it had an effect on me I, I'm going to throw it out there I guess that's because my even my education went so badly because the early years was were particularly humiliating and I didn't catch up and read and write as, as quickly as my peers. And I think probably music fed something that might have not otherwise existed. Well, we come from quite a sort of avid group of music listeners in my family. My father was particularly into music and, uh, and um, I think that probably had an influence. He sang a lot. It's interesting because you talk about your family with kind of a sense of... Like you were close and you were inspired by them and informed by them, but also this vague sense of separation that also... Are you close with your family? Did they encourage you? Oh, yeah, no, very close. Encourage me, well, I, you know, I didn't really give them much reason to, to hold on to hope when I was at school. My brother and sister seemed to do quite well, and I think there's this kind of, you know, sort of deep sense of culpability that I have comes from feeling bad about not sort of succeeding at school. Why does that still sort of linger today? Just one of those codes that you you know you like you try and shake off, but it, it's sort of that default thing. And the older you get, the better you are at sort of recognizing it and and avoiding perhaps some of the responses that you might have to that sensation. So I wouldn't say I'm affected by it as much. I'm just aware of it. Do you not feel smart and talented? Oh <laughs> no. <laughs> it's very humble. You get a lot of criticism, and it's a, it's it's a, it's brutal out there. Do you, you know? find criticism think, hard? Uh, yeah, I think like anybody, I'm quite a sensitive person, especially. So yeah, I probably would always find it difficult. Tell me, do you remember the first time you picked up a camera? Uh, yeah, I was told to put it down. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you? That was my father's camera. <laughs> I think he was constantly worried that I might break something that he'd worked hard to get. Um, it wasn't just cameras, it was all manner of things. But, um, I mean, it's weird actually. I was thinking about pictures before I actually made them, and I was pr because I was printing. I got given a job as a printer when I was 17. And that sort of... I suppose uh, was a sort of slow up run to starting to take my own pictures. Mm. I, I was seeing pictures before I was taking them. Actually, mm. I'm sure that everyone could say that, but it, in my case, it, it 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 was especially true because I was uh, able to visit um, a O level course when I was. Uh, Long and short of it was that I got a job when I was 17. That was mm. to be a printer, and I'd asked if I could get a sort of release for part of the week to maybe go and study and I thought maybe it's the first time I could turn my hand to something academic and, and I was allowed to go off on a Friday morning to sit on an O-level photography course at a college and 
it just so happened those were the well on that particular morning every week there was a kind of slideshow slash lecture and I think that was the sort of tipping point for me mm. who were the images by that you were looking at they started out with the masters and victorians and went all the way up to you know present times which was the early 80s then I am interested because some photographers particularly you know Tim Walker talked about it when he was interviewed for this series he talked about this kind of real passion and knowledge of, of the history of fashion photography and how he's informed by it and he references it. Are you the same? Not for fashion, not particularly, no. I'm very fond of certain fashion images, but I wouldn't call myself, uh, describe myself as being particularly au fait with that and that alone. Um, certainly wasn't the first kind of photography I looked at. It was more, I was looking at more reportage, and I know it might sound a bit worthy to sit here and to say that, uh, especially in contrast to, to, to what Tim was saying, but it took me a while to kind of find fashion photography. The early kind of, most of the pictures I was looking at early on were, 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 were reportage or document photography. And who are the, the fashion photographers that continue to influence you? Um, well, I mean, I, the obvious ones, it's Richard Avedon and Irving Penn, I would think. Mm. Tell me a little bit about, because um, you mentioned the kind of seeing images before before you kind of started taking them. And I'm interested because it kind of goes back to what I asked you right at the start. There is this, this notion that your, your imagery is kind of, yeah, spontaneous and like this idea that things just happen before, your, before the camera. But do you go to your shoots with an idea of the picture you want or do you just kind of see how it goes on the day of the shoot, see what happens? Uh, I have to have some sense of structure. And, and probably most of what happens is that you're, create the circumstances first. Put it this way, if I get there and all I do is recreate what I kind of think of, I probably would feel slightly disappointed. I think there has to be, um, you know, so therefore I guess that answers an early question. There is, a, there is always the, 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 I suppose the plan being is that you create enough sort of backup in, in, in sort of pre-visualizing so if you've got no ideas that present at the on you know on, on the hoof then you can fall back to those ideas but I, I, I want to you know really for me it's I mean somebody said I'm a typical Capricorn because I need to have solid ground in it before I can move forward and I think that's fair enough so that's just planning is just a way of creating sort of a safe platform from which to, to spring from and then I would go looking for uh, something that hadn't actually occurred and I like it when ideas occur as you're going as well what, what happens in my case especially is if it, I, I mean this sounds a bit corny as well but I will go looking for the song for that picture Interesting. and there's lots of music that I will always choose to listen to in order to warm up but there's sometimes a song that you perhaps hadn't expected to hear and as suddenly I, it will invent a character for me and I'll, I'll lock in to that then I used to have a friend that DJed for me, uh, who you met actually, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> who He's would... got particularly <laughs> wide range and, and, and good knowledge of music, so and, and lots of good taste as well. So he used to come and play on set, and he'd sort of watch what was happening with the picture and pick a song to go with it. And I'd, I'd sort of stand there for, you know, part of it and go, no, not that one, not that one, kill it, kill it and be quite bossy until we found the right tune. It Tell me some of the songs out. that I would I would have heard over David Sims shoots in the past. Oh God, I mean, it, again, it really depends on the mood. I mean, I, at some point, I always have to listen to Little Doll by by the, the Stooges. That one does it for me, and uh, always crashing in the same car by Bowie. Is a, but there's so many. And tell me, do you, I, I don't know if you feel like you have a best shot, that's a massive cliche to ask a photographer, but is there a song that's been playing where you've got a shot that you love particularly, where maybe you hated the song but now you love it? You know, I used to listen to uh, oh, Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere by Neil Young and I'm sure there's a few shots that I would say are significant to me on account of listening to that or having it ha uh, play while we were working, yeah. Let's go back a bit and talk, I want to kind of continue talking about your trajectory because I'm interested 
in the, some of the assisting jobs that you had because you assisted kind of all sorts of people. You assisted I went at- for an assisting job with Nick Knight and then he had me <laughs> stand in for a casting and I didn't get the casting or the, or the assisting Ultimate job. Ultimate rejection. So you should talk to him about I will, that. I'll, I'll, I'll pull him up on that. I'll tell him he missed a trick. He might not remember it probably tonight. <laughs> but tell me about some of the people you did assist because some of them, their aesthetics are very different to you. So sort of like Robert Erdman, Norman Watson, but you, you assisted Nigel Shaffron on some jobs yeah, as well. Yeah, briefly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so tell me about all of those different sort of roles. Well, it's my, probably my, my longest and earliest assisting job was with Robert, who uh, was really hardworking and a, a lot more technical than perhaps people might imagine. Um, He's also a very kind of ambitious and commercially ambitious photographer, really didn't stop working, I think, because he was driven by the need to, to succeed. Um, but in the process, I, he did pictures, which, I mean, I still have a sort of, you know, there's part of me that still loves to do what could be considered a very commercial image, but I do that in perhaps as somewhat, uh, why do, I like, why do I go towards that sort of image? Sometimes it's just because it's perhaps not what is expected of me. Mm. And now I also think they're very difficult to execute. Mm. So he, he kind of, I suppose, created a, a, a very steep learning curve for me as a taskmaster, tough guy to work for, 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 for a young 19 year old from the countryside. Did you have a good work ethic? I learned it on the job. I mean, I, I wouldn't describe myself as being particularly hard working. Um, and when you're working for somebody like that, it has to go up a notch, really. It's, it's a uh, fury, fast and furious process. Mm. Norman was great because um, whatever it took, he sort of had it. I mean, whether he inherited it from his father, um, I couldn't say. I guess he must have. He's well grown up in a household where they talk about photography and look at art. And Norman, I used to tear open his Polaroids. It's from those Lampack Polaroids. Uh, and sometimes I just used to look at the Polaroids and done think, how the hell did you see that? That's just astonishing. He was also really good fun to work with. His and it's slightly. Uh, he was complex, he was a slightly odd character really, but supremely talented and very funny and really good company. And tell me about working, because I'm interested in that period where you you said briefly you worked with, with Nigel, because I feel like he's almost, Nigel Shaffron, because he's almost, his aesthetic is, it's almost part of that set of you, where I think you established a kind of a new voice for no, fashion I, imagery. I, I can, I can, yes, I mean Nigel, You know, he's sort of, what is he? He's the most stubborn and resistant of people, I think. And I'm not sure if he makes a virtue of it or if it's just the thing he holds on to, but I think that's sort of profound in his pictures. Um, he hasn't ever seemingly steered his work towards what might be considered to be, to make it more desirable, more purchasable, or, you know, he, he, his work reflects him actually and he is a quietly sort of um, what's the word I guess he's a difficult character mm. and I liked that aspect of his work a lot I, I, was, I was drawn to it um, and he, he's good fun to work to be with and, and, and we went on some good adventures together uh, but that was very much towards the end of my time as an assistant and I was kind of already by then ready to kind of start doing my own thing. And, but I really enjoyed working for him. I really respected what he's, he stood for. And, what, and I think when I suppose work has an impact, it's because it, it you know, chimes very strongly. It's, it's, it, you know, it speaks about somebody's own personality and where they stand. The worst kind of work is where there's, there's just a constant sort of flim flam. You mm. don't really know where you stand with someone. Someone like, like Nigel isn't easy to get to talk to about his work, but in in that, I suppose, it, you know, within that experience of him, you kind of get closer to, to where his, where his uh, work stems from. Mm. And I'm interested in sort of you, because you mentioned before this kind of, that you perhaps didn't have the 
this knowledge of fashion, it wasn't something you were consuming. But by this point, you must have been kind of, yeah, more aware of the industry, more aware of the image makers, purely because you were assisting them. What titles were you kind of engaging with? Oh, the face. I mean, I was really, I was super impressed by Ray Petri. And that's what kind of drove me to want to work for Norman initially, because they'd had such a good collaboration over the years. But Ray was sort of like somebody who managed, I think, through his work to make London feel like it was a special place. Mm. We could have always been something of a backwater, I suppose, with our ID in the face. I think, you know, within, you know, this town, I, I guess it, fashion wouldn't have occurred quite the way it, it did and has done since. Mm. I mean, we just have a different take on it. You know, obviously, I think that's probably been talked about plenty of times. So I'm not going to harp on about it too much. But I think Ray, for me in particular, just because of my age, seemed to be, you know, the, the most important sort of uh, figure in all of that. Although there were lots of great and brilliant, talented people around as well at that time. Mm. It's interesting, I know you said you don't want to bash on about it, but that, that, that idea of London, because for you, you've mentioned a few times maybe, that you grew up in the countryside, you've talked about yourself as kind of a country boy. Did London symbolise something to you? Yes, it was only 45 miles away. Um, but it seemed like a, you know another, it could have easily been another continent, um, and the face uh, arrived in the local news agents, and I remember being um, it caught my eye straight away. Jerry Dammers was on the cover, maybe somebody here probably knows that, but um, whether Ray was in it at that time, I don't think he was, but it, it, it was this idea of fa- I didn't even, like, we keep saying fashion, but it wasn't something, a word that I used. They were just kind of like people wanting to dress differently. Mm. And, you know, within music, there's lots of examples of that. So it seemed to me just to, to be a, a style thing. It was directional. It wasn't business. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. Did you have ideas of, of beauty at that point? Did you know what kind of people, women or men, you, you thought were beautiful and you thought were intriguing? Because I think that's one of the things that... Yes, again, through music, you know, lots of, lots of things that you'd find yourself strangely attracted to. But I think, you know, I perhaps I was particularly lucky growing up in a time where that, it felt like a lot of the, the styles that sort of musicians were kind of adopting was... was was really their own, generated by their own imagination. It didn't come with any real sophistication attached to it. So you could, it, although it did appear to be extremely sophisticated, you you could still kind of venture with it as a as a kid. And were you dressing then like you dress now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we tried. I mean, we've you know, living where I was. I mean, we used to. It's funny. I was talking to somebody about this the other day, how, how vintage describes, you know, so many things for people now. But there was a store in the local town where I lived in. It wasn't called Vintage Anything. It wasn't even called Flea Market. Or you'd either go to the charity shop, but there was a shop that was called Revisited. And, and I remember asking my mum, what did that mean? And she meant basically it's dead people's clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we were wearing. Yeah, Bowie was a huge influence. So he was trying to dress like him as, as much as you could afford to dress like him. And tell me a bit, you mentioned when you were assisting, you were getting to that point where you wanted to start sort of just doing it on your own. What were your pictures like at that point? I didn't, you know, when I was assisting, I had so little time to, to make my own images. I had been particularly impressed when I was 16 from what I'd seen of the American photogra- photographers, and in particular, Larry Clark. And I think, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed saying that now because... I, I didn't, I was so little of what he was photographing, I, you know, was, I didn't particularly understand, it wasn't familiar to me, I wasn't involved in a scene like that, but I respected him, first of all, you know, for being able to take those, make those kind of images and print them and do all of the kind of work with this sort of craft skills that people don't really talk about when he's discussed as a photographer. Mm. Um, which now he sort of eschewed a little bit, really. There was a uh, there was a kind of a desire in me to kind of make something raw, and I suppose you know what people would say now is a sort of rock and roll spirit. I guess. I mean, you, you know, my my one single abiding 
desire at that point was to photograph Iggy Pop. So I guess I was just kind of imitate, aping what I thought ever he might be up to at that point. Mm. It's interesting because you've said in interviews before that kind of the imagery that you guys, when I say you guys, I do mean that set of image makers. And I think you ushered in a new aesthetic, people like yourself, people like Jürgen, you know, Corinne Day. And you said that that kind of aesthetic and that grungy aesthetic, that it was circumstantial. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, it's only circumstantial because I think that um, it wasn't like you could go to a designer and you weren't documenting anything that was sort of already made or written up. It was just kind of being made on the hoof. Um, I mean, I was just I was just kind of copying the things that I th I thought were great and turned me on. That's all. Hmm. It's interesting you say you were copying the things that you thought were great. Very few people are comfortable admitting that, I think. But all, all young creatives do that. When you're a writer, you copy the writers you think I are good. I don't know how you get there otherwise. The, I always think the magic comes from kind of thinking that you're copying something. To, I don't think you imagine it's pastiche. What you're doing is celebrating something that re, you relate to in someone else's work. And inevitably, because it's you and it's not them, you know, you kind of allude well, pre-digital, let's say, you could never copy something to the nth degree that things seem to be able to sort of be pastiche now. And it was the mistakes, it was the things that you didn't get right that almost kind of make it significant now. Mm -hmm. I, f I often, uh, you know, the naivety is what kind of informed the result more than the, the know-how. Was there a point where you stopped copying? Uh, no, because I think sometimes you're sort of forced to copy things, which is a slightly depressing answer to that. But, um, however, what I'm trying to avoid is comparisons with my peers and, and my own generation. I sort of feel, feel like that sort of propriety, the sense of it has been lost in this sort of rush for content and 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 it seems like whoever does something now, it's the person that did it last, kind of owns the, 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 you know, the signature title on, on, on work, which I find really shocking. Mm -hmm. There didn't seem to be much that can be done about that. Uh, and so therefore I'm trying to do at my best or at my freest is to kind of outrun the notions of things that people might have for what's right and what's the zeitgeist. I'm not, I don't, care about those things really I kind of want to always sort of turn it on its head but how do you combine that with having you know a style and having something that people know you for and and respect you for you know it's funny I think you kind of have to let go and you can't and I'm sure other photographers will feel the same if if what informs a picture was a naivety and, and, and you know, a connection with things, it's when you're, you're young, you're, you're wide open, you're, inf you're influenced, you know, daily. Um, and the older you get, the more familiar you are with the kind of your surroundings and the kind of landscape that you operate in. So you're not gonna be as stunned and as blown away by things. Um, so therefore, when someone says, well, do a 90s picture, I can, you, well, I, I'm not that person anymore. It would, I think it would dis do a disservice to the early work to, to copy it, but it happens a lot. And I know why people do it, because they're fond of those images. They want it to be, uh, you, know, they're re you know, remade. Uh, but it becomes, you know, it, that becomes, pastiche in yourself is a particularly painful thing to do, I think. Yeah. So that, you know, whether that's just a voice in my head or a spectre of fear, I don't know. But I want to do things that surprise me, even though that I'm, what you will do is perhaps discover a new element, a new, a new something that you can work on. And, and you try to kind of take that to its furthest extent. And then maybe you're finished with it. It's interesting from what you say, it makes me wonder, do you sometimes think it's easier to produce good work when you're younger? Not necessarily younger in terms of age, just younger in terms of less informed. Yes, because that insouciance means that you're free, you're not perhaps so aware of some of the fit 
you know, sort of, uh, I, I guess, yeah, definitely. I mean, the thing is, I also wish that when I was younger, I wasn't so uptight and I'd done more than I did. I sort of look back on uh, that time and think, I should have just gotten on with doing more. That would always be my encouragement to someone in their 20s or even younger who's sort of wanting to, to, to be creative is just, you've just got to just go with your instincts. Mm. I tended to critique it that much. I mean, for, it was Anna Coben that helped me out of that habit really a little bit because I used to draw everything. Uh, what do you mean, I, draw everything? Well, I've, well, I didn't, I didn't imagine that I was. I thought I was going to be a cartoonist when I was young. As so I used to draw a lot, and I had these little A5 ring-bound sketch pads, Dela, the yellow and red things. I don't have any more. I'm still really fond of them, actually. But what happened was I ended up with a drawer full, a sort of filing cabinet full of these sketches, which were all intended to be ideas for photographs, but never got done. And then it was, it was Anna Coben that came around one day and sort of said, you've got, you have to stop drawing. You've got to just do pictures. And, uh, you know, it was inarguable, really. That's all I, she was right. That's what I had to do. I'm interested that you mentioned Anna, because also, you are a very collaborative person. I find yeah. that interesting with you and, and people who you've worked with, you've had these kind of very intense, um, almost quite wayward relationships with where I'm never I'm quite sure who I'm did a, what. Yeah, they are a bit wayward, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me one in particular. Tell me about meeting Guido, because that must have had a big, a big impact. He, he was a hairdresser for, for quite a long time before the, the sort of, you know, fashion history would have you believe his career started in the 90s, but he didn't. He was, he was kind of quite a busy hairdresser through the 80s as well. And, uh, You're outing him now. <laughs> I am outing him, yeah, rightly so. Because I think he couldn't have got to where he did. Yeah. Without, the, there's a sort of necessary skill set that doesn't come because you st stood watching somebody in a salon for, for a couple of years. You know, he was, he was sort of schlepping himself around London and you know, working for all manner of publications until I met him, he was working with Robert and I think his career sort of took on a, you know, accelerated working alongside him. And when I first started taking pictures for the face, we didn't have any hair and makeup at all. It, I wouldn't have, it would be great to say I was adamantly against having it. I mean, I think I wanted my pictures to happen and to, to occur in and amongst the very small, the smaller the number of people around it, the better. But eventually, uh, Guido came on board and I remember sort of having a conversation with him that went something like, well, let's just see where this takes us. And, you know, I think his hand evolved again when he started to work with, with Lee McQueen his work with me was very particular, but I think Lee opened a, and it happened at a particular point in his life as well. Uh, and I think that he, he started to do other things that he probably would never have done if he'd only ever worked alongside himself. Hmm. Tell me, how, what was your working relationship like? Because it must have been a lot more than just kind of him doing the kind of the beauty on the shoot and you taking the pictures, were you referencing together? Were you kind of just going out together? What was it? There was more conversation. You know, the idea, whole idea of like swipe art, which is what they kind of, I heard that first, that term first used in, in the States, well in New York in particular, and thinking that's weird. You mean they put a picture in front of you and go, this is the reference, that's what we do. It's seemingly part and parcel of the nature of the way images are arrived at now and I'm no less guilty of it than anybody else in some cases but it, for me it's only a start point mm. the thing that you want to do is engage in something that you feel you possess and you own if you if you're stuck looking at a picture thinking I've got to recreate that it it's never going to be a good marriage at all mm. I mean even to the extent we used to get this kind of thing we call it sort of Polaroid fever where you do a great Polaroid and then you'd spend a good hour of your life trying to recreate what you've seen in Polo, but you can't. And I think really what you need from your collaborators, and what I had in particular with Guido, is a huge amount of support. If I was feeling a little tentative about something, he'd kind of give you that nudge and go, you can do it. And, you know, I really appreciated having that around. I mean, and then you just have those conversations that may go on sometimes, you know, after a shoot and, and between shoots and they just for me they sort of cook up 
uh, a conviction, a sense of, an, of, of, of uh, belief in, in an idea and who you want to be. I think the weird thing about creativity for me is the way I kind of arrive at sort of engaging with an idea is that it sometimes lives surrounded by the things you don't want to be. It's really odd, perhaps contradiction or contrary thing to say rather is that, you know, I don't want to be that, but it helps you to identify yeah. with the thing that you do want. What were you worried about being? And are those the same things you're worried about being today? Not believed, I suppose, back then. Do you feel that less now? Uh, you know, there wasn't so much irony in what I did back then, and I know that's sort of like a little... You know, the idea of something being ironic isn't exactly sort of, you know, I, something I alone possess. But I like hiding meaning inside something that on the surface seems to be, to, to, uh, be lightweight and, and kind of pointless. Mm. It's, it's code, isn't it? Because you, you only want to kind of like, you don't want people to come up to all this slap you on the back and go, oh, I get it, you're... Great. I mean, that can be as sort of undermining as having somebody turn around and go, they hate your work. Sometimes somebody hating your work is an affirmation that you're doing things the right way. Tell me, I'm interested, you say, you know, you were worried about not being believed. Do you look at your fashion imagery and think it is authentic? Some of it, yeah. I mean, there's always got to be a corner of the frame that kind of you own. I mean, even if I'm doing a picture for the most commercial of entities, uh, you know, you've got to you've got to kind of look at it and go, well, that, well, that bit's me, that little narky shitbag kid who looks like a beautiful woman jumping around in a dress. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's an interesting notion. You kind of touched on there. It's something I was I really want to ask, which is, you know, that that aesthetic and perhaps you know you said you wouldn't call it anti-fashion or grunge or whatever it was, but that aesthetic that you were you were pushing, maybe like the narky kids is a good way of putting it. Like it did become commodified, not just from you, but from, and again, I don't want to pigeonhole you, but that, that set of you, Glenn Lutchford, Corinne Day, it did become part of the way fashion saw beauty. It became fashionable and then it became glamorous and, and it stopped being teenagers and it became models and they were the ones wearing their makeup and kind of posing. And was that, firstly, was that an odd process to see happen? And, and how did you handle that? You know, uh, I, Never found it flattering when someone pick, picks on one of my pictures to copy at all. That's the short answer to that. And, you know, like I said, I was trying to create a sort of sense of belief and authenticity in my work, which, you know, it sounds a bit preposterous to sit here and, and push that. But I can't pursue something without a real sense of conviction. So I have to, sometimes I have to manifest that, sometimes it's there freely. Um, so to see it kind of like taken on mm. as a as a, a zeitgeist thing, or a, you know, that's the blueprint, that's the answer, is is sort of you know it it messes me up. Tell me more about that. What being messed up? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I d I don't quite know what else I can tell you that that you know. You, I am very possibly very possessive. I don't mm. want to see things that I feel are my signature and my own ideas, you know, chopped around. It, it cheapens it for me. It takes the virtue away. Mm. It must be strange now because that aesthetic, you said the word 90s before and that's it, like that 90s aesthetic, it's, it's the, so fashionable now and it's having this odd revival amongst young image makers and young designers and... Is, is that quite odd? Uh, it's odd if it's presented to me as something new, yeah. Um, I can understand why there's a generation that wants to sort of strip back the layers and get back to some kind of raw harmony, some sense of sincerity in their work. I wouldn't say it's of a great interest to me at all because, you know, uh, I feel like I read through it and I think that I think there are some real major protagonists of that style which do it very well who for example well nigel yeah uh i'm therefore i it's like saying well you're gonna 
listen to Brian Adams or Bob Dylan. Why would I bother with the other? You know, yeah. people have their choices. That's they can listen and look at to. They can listen to and what, look at whatever they like. I I just feel there has to be a uh, a distinction between what's a good thing and, and not so good. And the not so good is never good. But do you worry though? Because you kind of touched on it before. You know, the industry has, works at an incredible pace, and I think there is this. Um, complete obsession with the new and the young and and do you worry sometimes that actually people don't even remember who did it first sometimes there is that i think i, I think it's, it's sort of lost in like i said earlier on it's sort of the last person to do something is the first yeah exactly. i don't think i'm the only one to feel like that about imagery but i think that's particularly you're only going to ever hear that from somebody probably my age i don't think it really matters so much I don't think it's a preoccupation the way it was. Look, in the 90s, if you were kind of found copying somebody's work, or if there was a similarity, it was, it was a, you went into a crisis. Mm. Um, and it was the kind of cruelest thing you could say to somebody on set uh, or in, in, a, in that environment. Well, that looks a bit like so-and-so. It, it would really undermine uh, that idea very quickly. Whereas I think there's almost that's that is the virtue now. Oh God, it looks like that. It's the catch, you know. Yeah, people want hook. that feel and they want that hook. So I think that is what drives it a little bit. And tell me, I'm interested just in this in this notion of kind of the pace of the industry. And is it hard to collaborate in the way that you enjoy doing now in the way that the industry works because it is much more. Yes, yeah, much quicker. Is it hard to have those meaningful relationships that you talked about relying on? Uh, I, I could be that it's just me. My answer to that would be yes, because people have less time. Um, we'd have weeks and weeks between one project and another. And we would kind of meander in those weeks mm. and, and describe things that we would perhaps feel um, inspirational. And, and um, I don't have so much of that time right now. Mm. Has, there become, has there ever come a choice in your career where, because we kind of jumped quite a lot forward, I imagine you starting on your own. And did there come a point where you realised that your work was very influential and, and that people and you kind of thought, I'm, I'm going to be part of fas fashion and the establishment and the industry. Was there ever a moment where you thought, actually, hang on, I can... I think probably when I went to New York as a photographer for the first time and I started to work um, for some of those American publications and, and it, you know, you were very aware of what was being talked about, not just about me, but other, other people from London. And I didn't last very long in that environment because I was so, like I said, I was quite narky really, and I made myself a bit unpopular in one or another art department, and so more or less got sort of chased out of town, really, and came back to London. And I was lucky at that point, I was asked to go and talk with um, Francis Hodgson about maybe doing an exhibition at, at Zwemmer's that was, had always been a bookshop, but they were start, starting a gallery, and um, I kind of was a bit suspicious, really. I thought, well, is he just want to kind of tap into this kind of you know, this name thing. Uh, so I took a set of prints. I mean, it sounded, I, I thought I was being clever at the time, but now I'm hearing myself say it in such a public space. It sounds like a really stupid idea, but I kind of put prints in that I thought he might opt for because they were more known and more commercial and, and, and sort of distributed a few lesser known images in and amongst them and hoping that, you know, he would kind of fall flat on his face and go, I want these and they're in. I'd know that I didn't have to go through the process of doing an exhibition, which is quite a frightening idea for me. So I was kind of half of me hoped that it wouldn't <laughs> work. But he turned out to be such a smart man and has a, such a fantastic insight, I think, to, for photography that he immediately picked out the pictures that I thought he would have missed. And we agreed to do an exhibition, but then suddenly look, thinking and looking at, uh, uh, about an exhibition, looking at my pictures on the wall, I suddenly, I sort of felt absolute sort of like, uh, you know, I thought they were kind of abhorrent, really. I thought they were useless. So I decided then to switch styles and started to rather than use 
daylight in pictures, over lighting things. And that's, that was my, my reaction to seeing things that were done all in natural light. I suddenly wanted to go the complete opposite end of the, the scale and, and use as many lights as I could fit into to one sitting. And then the, then came the blue background, which was a, cho it was a choice again, because I wanted to have something that couldn't possibly be copied because mm. it was so ugly, it was so not good taste that uh, I thought it would escape, you know, this trend thing. It's really interesting to me because it feels like, and correct me if I'm wrong, it feels like most of your career decisions and maybe aesthetic turning points have been driven through insecurity <laughs> rather than conscious decision. You'd have to, I think we'd have to sort of probably have a sit-down analysis. analysis. Don't want to sound like your therapist. But <laughs> it feels like you, it comes from a kind of not wanting to be like something or want to prove something. I know, yeah, it's what, that's, the, that's the confusing bit, isn't it? Wanting to be like, but doing nothing about it. You know, doing everything. I think, I, I guess what that is, and I do, this is really not the time or the place, but I'm going to go ahead anyway. I suppose what I'm doing is testing whether people actually really want to see this picture. So what I do is, 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 is kind of cover it all with these rather sort of what might be choice sort of, sort of bad components because at the heart of it is something that matters to me and I'm close to and that is about as good a description as I'll ever give it, I think. Mm. And tell me, do you... It's, it's a hard question. So I, I feel like there's a lot of emotion in your work, but I don't feel particularly like there's that much darkness. And I think that's something that co that's very different to some of the people who you kind of started out with, people like Kareen, perhaps, or people that maybe your, some of your peers were referencing, people like Nan Golding. There's not the same... I, I mean, darkness doesn't interest me per se. Look, a lot of my heroes have indulged in their own darknesses and their behaviours, and I am not without sin. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm not alluding to anything sort of, you know, terrible, but I mean, I think we're all susceptible and vulnerable to, to you know, to, to things that might make us appear to be dark. The real dark behaviour is the abusive behaviour. So, no, I'm not interested in dark. If people find that they have passion in looking at sort of, you know, morbidity or, or I don't know, high romance or whatever it is, but for me there has to be freedom first. I don't really see a virtue in something that's dark on its own. It's kind of bullshit to me. That's just like banging drums. It doesn't mean anything. Mm. Do you think that there, but there always has to be some form of kind of emotion, something... I think there has to be a hope for the work. The work has to arrive at something. It's got to communicate. And it's up to the, you know, it's up to, to the artist to, to decide what they're communicating. Mm. If it doesn't reach you, it doesn't reach you. I, I think there's like a lot of, there's a kind of obligation now to go with art and, and sort of accept it because, you know, art's the great communicator and I think by and large that's absolutely the truth but I think this distinction between whether it works or whether it's it's good is 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 it's become sort of growingly difficult we're all sort of informed by the sort of the, the critics before now there's so much art it's sometimes kind of just all you can lose the good in amongst the bad quite quickly I think mm. but if you can stand there and think that it's kind of meant something for you I guess then I can't believe I'm bordering on talking about fucking art here. Right <laughs> it's now. good. Do you feel, I mean, do, do you think people miss the point in your pictures quite a lot? I've never really bothered to sit and think about that too much. It's, it's, it's whether I think it's there and then I assume that instinctively or naturally someone who's in tune with whatever that, 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 in, that little ingredient is that they'll pick it up. Well, I really like it when somebody says that there's a romance in my pictures. Mm. Because I, I think then, ah, oh, they're seeing it, you know. It's, 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 not a, it's not the first thing. It's not written all over the picture. I find romantic pictures, wholesale romantic pictures, really a bit iffy. Mm. This is a much more simplistic question, but I think some of your most loved imagery is of men rather than women. Do you prefer shooting women or do you prefer shooting men? 
you know, the thing is, it's the thing about men is there's so many kind of taboos that kind of like stand in front of describing men that it's just easy prey. You know, women are presented in a, in a bigger variety. It's more diverse. You know, they can play with the sexuality or the sort of, you know, but for men, it's still slightly restricted, even though that sounds silly to be sitting here and saying that now. I think there's something about the private world of men which is, is quite compelling and, th and then perhaps that's what I'm sort of trying to uh, tap into with those works. And if, if there is loved imagery that I've done of girls, it's because they look more like boys in any case. It doesn't really bother too much with the standard sort of uh, the principles of, of, of what femininity are. Mm. It's interesting just talking more about that notion. Do you feel... Because I think, you know, there's so much said about the way fashion imagery and the fashion community depicts beauty and depicts standards of beauty. Do you feel like a, a responsibility as a fashion image maker? Sometimes, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're particularly important to me. What, what sort of responsibility would I need to take I on? guess maybe do you, do you worry about the way... The, it's not so much the boring thing. Are we talking about anorexia? Is no, that yeah, in a way, but bigger than that. Do you think about the, eff the effect that kind of like, because fashion image is so prolific, it's everywhere, and, and fashion's so popular now. And do you feel that the, an image that you create can, will be seen as something incredibly aspirational to someone very young? I, you know what, I think there's, there's, there's a little bit of a danger in thinking so much about it and the, the way that that question sort of describes is it might, it might stop me dead in my tracks and whether I'm engaging in it um, enough is, is probably for other people to decide but I, 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 the honest and simple answer to that is no, I don't really think about those things necessarily. I think about who's in front of me and am I responsible for them, yeah. Mm. Definitely. If someone wants to collaborate and they're willing to do things, and it's fine. You know, there's a kind of sign-off on, on it, it should be mutual. I don't want to feel like somebody's sort of intimidated or suffering in front of my camera. Mm. And tell me, do you have things in your, in your career that you still want to achieve? Are there, where do you see the direction of your image making going? Where do you see yourself going? Because you have had time, times off in your career, and I'm interested in how, how do you always kind of bring yourself back and keep, keep going? Coming back was, was a, something of a mammoth effort, really. I think just taking time out like that, sort of, you know, I guess the machine that sort of exists in order to kind of keep you going and, and being creative and asking things from yourself had, had sort of more or less come to a grinding halt so to kind of getting back was quite tricky but I also think probably mostly that was because I came back in, a, in an analog you know period and came back in a in straight into the digital one so I think I was playing catch up I felt completely useless at the, at the sort of start of that return um, I what drives me is it, you know and it's simple um, and if not very cliche is to say that I think probably the best thing I'm going to do is the next thing. I, th I think that uh, it, it's funny, you know, you're kind of all those sort of peaks and troughs, all the turns in, in, in the river are, are, happen and occur for all manner of different reasons. So I'm just kind of quite happy to keep going. With, it sounds terribly whimsical, it's not. I mean, there's mm. a, there's a, there is a determination in there as well. Have you come to like fashion? Because you talk about... You talk I've come about to understand it a lot more. Mm. I think I like it less. <laughs> Why? Uh, because I think it's in a phase now where I think that people imagine that product is king. And I think there has to be a respect for product. But I think ideas and style are the most important. I think don't, people don't relate to product. You mm. can't, I mean, you can have a hundred handbags. If you don't have a sense of what, what a thing is, it, it, it won't necessarily be any, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the uh, that sort of capricious nature that some designers rely on for people. Oh, I, I was this yesterday, but now I'm that. But I think probably what 
made me have any sense of belonging within within this industry at all was that, that it can talk about attitudes and it can talk about uh, spirit and I think we're not really in that time now because everything has to be successful I remember a singer once saying to me well, you're fine being a photographer because like if you do one set of pictures for ID every six months you you keep your credibility I have to sell loads of records and if I don't I don't have any credibility it doesn't matter how good the work is and I remember not really getting it at the time. I thought, no, your work's great. What you're worried about is a bit simplistic about it. But I kind of think that things have to be successful now. And I, for one, find that particularly sort of like depressing. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that. If um, You know, it's like if you're going to turn up to a meeting, so say, how many Instagram followers have you got? Yeah. Who gives a fuck? You've got to look at what's in front of you. And I think there's a great importance given to all of the above, which is deeply ironic given that I'm talking on the internet right now, isn't it? I mean, I, d I don't know what to say further than that, but it, it confounds me. But I do you feel that be... when you shoot a campaign? Do you feel that b before it was the brand that felt the responsibility that that campaign would sell the bag or the dress or the shoe? Do you no, now I feel I that? I think that what has happened is it's people think that there's a formula for everything and there just isn't. A formula for everything what there is is there's sense and there's ideas and there's desire there are some deeply human qualities in work was what people want if they're investing in uh, creating something pr producing something they want their return which to me kind of yes I get it if you want that yacht in the harbor that you know you can operate from f through the summer season, fine. But I don't think that's what's spoken traditionally to women. I don't think it's spoken to anybody. You know, it's that kind of manufacture element that I think is, is in danger of undermining, you know, what little interest there is left for design, really. Mm. And so when a designer comes along, who has convictions and wants to talk about spirit and wants to test people's appreciation of things, all those things that may not relate to the mass market, I'm glad because at least it gives, I think, a little better breath of life back to what for me are the, are the, 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 true, the true values that give, I think give light to this. The industry didn't start out as, as a sort of, you know, a, an, a, de a highly industrialized process. It was something else and I think we're, we're, we're maybe looking at some of the sort of, you know, uh, it's, it's like we're in occupied, we're, we're being occupied at the moment, I think. You seem very apprehensive about the future of fashion. No, no, I don't. I'm not apprehensive because I think like from what I can tell, people still want to be creative. It's just that whether their voice will be heard through the usual channels is, is, is to be seen, you know? And I guess that's why there's a host of people who are wanting to make their own magazines and, and, and that can be a, 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 you know, a launch for their ideas and their work. It just, it just uh, I think you get what I mean. I can't, I, I can't give you the sort of, you know, the punchline to all of this. But do you uh, feel like your voice is being heard? Well, I, I presume maybe somebody's out there listening right now, who knows, but... Uh, Sometimes, sometimes. David, thank you very much. Pleasure.